Dear friends in Jesus Christ, great to see you today. We're dealing with an important topic today, one that is difficult, but yet one that we should know more about. The question I'm trying to ask today, is LGBTQ good for the USA? We have a lot of that out there, but is it good for our nation? That's the major question that we're coming to. In the sermon today, we're going to take a look at the first part of this new brochure with that same title. So today you can follow along with the outline in the folder, and I hope you come next week. I want to give you a copy of the whole brochure because it's going to lay the, lay the groundwork today. Then we're going to get into some really important things next week. So please stick with it. Please give me a chance to say some of these things that are really important. I'm trying to paint a big picture, so I wish I could do it all at once, but I don't think you'll tolerate a one-hour sermon, so we have to divide it in two. Anyway, though, as we think about our nation, people have mentioned over the years the idea of a frog in the water. Now, some people say that's a myth. I don't know if it works or not. I never tried it, though. But what they say, though, is you can take a frog, and if you put it in water that is a comfortable temperature, the frog will stay there. You can turn up the heat, and eventually it will boil to death and not even get it that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Again, is that true or not? Well, thinking about the frog idea, if we think about our nation, and we go back about 75 years ago, if we jump all the way back to 1947, that was a time where the Supreme Court made a decision in order to try to separate the church from the state. Now, that's come up in the history of our nation, but that was a fundamental time, though, back there in 1947. Now that's at a time, think about it, that's at a time where our nation should have been so much rejoicing because of the victories God had given us in World War II. Like we weren't that great of a nation back then. We should have lost and yet we won by the grace of the Almighty God. And what do we start to do shortly after that time? We start to push the Almighty God out of our nation. Now, it happened very gradually. So over 75 years, we're talking about inch by inch by inch by inch. Let me try to help you understand that a little bit more. In this whole series, both today and next week, we're going to take a look at the Christian beginning of our nation. We're going to take a look at the present trouble that we're in, and especially next week when I share a little bit more of that present trouble. I think you'll be shocked when I bring that together and show you what I'm talking about. But then we're going to talk about a path to blessing, a path to blessing for every individual, for every church body, for every corporation, for our nation itself, and for everyone else in between that I failed to identify. I want to start with some basic Bible truth today. So let's lay a foundation here and understand that God made the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So fundamental, so important, so foundational. What else can we say about a basic Bible truth? God made the people. The Bible says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. How is it that we have like an unlimited number of genders today? Isn't it so simple that God created them male and female? Anytime we begin to get away from God's word, we're going to be in trouble, and we are there today as a nation. You'll also be surprised next week when I share some things with you how so many in our nation are accepting of so many of these crazy things in agreement with these crazy things. I never thought the percentages would be nearly as high as they are. What else can we say here about something foundational? Let's understand that God established each nation. Acts 17, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. 
Think about what we have in Romans chapter 13. It tells us that God has established every nation and God is the one who sustains every nation. And when a nation stops being a nation, that's because God has taken action to stop it from being a nation. Some people think, oh, as people, we've got it all figured out. We made it happen. We established it. We keep it going. It's all up to us. Not at all. Let's understand how the Almighty God is so much at work in the world today. And then we know that God gave instructions. People today oftentimes think that anything goes. Whatever I think is good, that's a fine idea. But let's understand who God is. And let's understand that God has the right to say what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. We have a little bit of an idea when we look at the Ten Commandments, for example. We can find them in two places in the Bible. They're in Exodus and also in Deuteronomy. But there are so many other things that God has said about what is best for us. Think about what Moses said to the Israelites shortly before they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he said to the people, So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, in other words, all these laws, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival. These things that God has given us, these are not to restrict us. These are not to hurt us. These are for our good. These are for our survival. Let us look upon them in that way. And then, of course, God loves us so much that even though we've all fallen miserably short of what he requires, what has God done? God has made the way of eternal life through his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God has done that for every single person. Sometimes we might think we're the good guys and maybe we don't need Jesus so much, but let's understand when we have one sin, when we have a half of a sin, we desperately need Jesus. But Jesus is so awesome that even the person with like 50 trillion sins, Jesus is their guy. Why is that? because all 50 trillion sins were put on him on Good Friday, and he paid the penalty, and through him, even that guy with 50 trillion, the way is open through Jesus. We cannot out-sin the grace, the love, the forgiveness of God. Isn't that so amazing? Whoever's out there thinking, oh, I've messed up so much that I'm done. No way. Jesus has made the way for you. That is good news. What about the founding of our nation? Well, first of all, I want to go to a quote from the Library of Congress. It says, Many of the British North American colonies that eventually formed the United States of America were settled in the 17th century by men and women who, in the face of European persecution, refused to compromise passionately held religious convictions and fled Europe. Now, are we saying that every single person that founded our nation was in that situation? By no means, but many of them were in that situation. We had serious Christian people coming to America in order to have religious freedom. And then going to a quote from Cambridge University, Christianity and the Bible have left a distinct and significant mark on American jurisprudence. Indeed, Christian influences were woven into the common law the colonists brought with them from England and the laws the colonists framed once they arrived in the New World. What is that saying? It's saying that the people who came, they were Bible-believing Christians, So when they set up the laws of our nation, they used the Bible, and what God said was good. They said, hey, let's go with that. We want to be godly. We want to honor our great God. And what God said was wrong, 
a lot of times they established laws that said, if you go against our God, there's going to be a penalty. So there was a definite connection between the word of God and the laws of our land. Have our laws changed over the years? So much they have changed. In summary, though, those who settled, they were in agreement with the Bible in a general sense. How has our nation canceled God? We've done it in so many ways. We could jump back, for example, to that decision in 1947. I don't even have that on the list here, but that was actually a decision by the Supreme Court in favor of religion, in favor of Christianity. However, though, from that point onward, people used that decision in a negative way. What that decision talked about is this wall of separation that we have to have between religion and the government. Is that what our Constitution calls for, a wall of separation? It calls for a very unique wall. What our Constitution is saying, that the government should never ever influence the churches so there should be a wall from the government going that way, but there is no wall from the churches influencing the government. In other words, let's have that godly influence upon our government. That is how our nation was established. That is how it should be. And yet when our government started talking about this idea of separation and, oh, if you're a church and you try to influence the government, you're going to get in trouble. And how many churches like backed away and thought, oh, we better not get in trouble here. We better behave. But that was not the intention. The intention was that every Christian church every Bible believer would have a positive, godly influence upon our nation. That has been shut down for a long time, for the most part. Let's look at how our nation is canceling God. Go back to 1962, and that was when prayer was removed from public schools. 1963, that is when the Bible was removed from public schools, even though, think about it, with the founding of our nation, the Bible, that was the textbook, and now, many years later, we can't even have it in the schools. You can see a very big change that took place over a long period of time, and then we jump ahead to 1973, and we have canceled the idea of babies. If you are pregnant and you don't want your baby, you can legally put it to death. Let's understand that that is a very good parallel between what the people were doing in the Old Testament when they offered their children to the false god of Molech. So they had children that they didn't want. What's a good way to get rid of them? Let's offer them to our false god. In the 1960s, kind of the hippie era, the free sex era, we have a lot of unwanted babies. What do we do as a nation? Oh, let's just legalize the killing of babies. That will take care of the problem. What should we have done? We should have said, oh, as a nation, we're getting so far away from the Word of God. Let's dig into the Word of God and let's address the sin of our day but no, we didn't do that. Rather, we put a law in place that we thought would somehow fix the problem, and yet it was a great offense to the Almighty God. Not a good thing at all, but we've done that over and over again. What about in 1980, removed the Ten Commandments from the public schools. 1987, stopped teaching creation in the public schools. If we're not teaching creation, what are we saying? We are saying we evolved. We are saying there is no God. We are saying life has no purpose. Everything is by random chance. There is no eternity. So think about it. Since 1987, that is what is being taught, and it is completely untrue. It is completely against the foundation of the entire Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These are such foundational 
things, and yet we have gotten so far away from them. And then the final one here on my list, 2011, that is when LGBTQ history was required teaching in the public schools. We're going to come more to that topic as we go, but that's not the only topic, though, of this particular series of this brochure. Keep in mind, we're trying to look at the big picture. There's all kinds of sin that we have not dealt with as a nation, and it has led us into great trouble, and you'll see more of that coming up next week. Real quick here, ways that we're opposing God. So God created, and yet we teach that, again, we evolved. There is no God. God gives life. I mean, think about a child. Every one of us were children at one time, so much loved by our parents. So God is giving that precious gift of every child. And what have we done as a nation? We have legally murdered over 60 million according to our records, and probably, I would estimate, probably well over a hundred million because many are not being recorded because people are getting pregnant, they're taking a pill, the pill is aborting the child, and there's no record of it. Think about it. Our nation only has 320 million people in it, and maybe we have aborted one hundred million people. It's hard for me to understand why God would continue to bless us as he does today. We are in great trouble as a nation, I believe, but at the same time, we have many blessings. What's going on, though? Some people think that, oh, God is still blessing us, therefore, God must be approving of all these different things. That's why he's continuing to bless us. Is that the way to interpret the blessings that we have today? Not at all. The way to interpret them is that God is a very patient God. But eventually his patience will run out. And when it does, we are going to see the wrath of God upon our nation should we just let it go and see what happens? I don't want to do that. I would rather see every person, I would rather see our entire nation repent. Let's be more like Nineveh. When Jonah went and preached to them, I actually didn't expect any kind of a good response from Nineveh. Keep in mind the Ninevites, they were like ISIS. They were brutal people. If they came to attack you, they would cut your heads off. They were brutal, brutal people. Jonah went to them and he preached a very short sermon and amazingly, everybody repented. They were all in sackcloth and ashes, including the animals. It was a tremendous thing. And what did the Lord do? He relented. He did not bring the destruction that he promised to bring. An interesting note here, when Jonah told them about the destruction that would come, the word for destruction is the same word used for the destruction of Sodom. Is it possible that those people in Nineveh, they very well remembered what God had done to Sodom? And when Jonah used that same word, did that catch their attention? And they're like, oh my goodness, God means business. And maybe that led them to repent. Uh, I'm going to touch on Sodom a little bit next week, not a lot, but a little bit, and remind you of what we talked about last year on September 10th. Also, too, in this category of opposing God, God created male and female. He created them to get married. He created them to be fruitful and multiply. But what has happened, though, in our nation, so many are living together without marriage, that is not the will of God. So many are living in gross immorality. That is not the will of God. And the shocking part is that oftentimes they're doing so without shame. If you think over the decades, at one time, I mean, people have always lived in immorality. Let's be honest, it's always happened. But there used to be a time, though, where it happened and it was secretive. 
And then it kind of became normalized, I would say, in our nation, maybe about 20 years ago, where people are like, oh, yeah, that's what we're doing, and we're out in public about it, and everything is fine. But now we have slipped in our current time to celebrating our immorality. But can you see, though, how we've come down that road and how it's such a serious matter? Now, oftentimes for young people, they don't even quite know all that the Bible teaches. But for any of us who discover that, oh, I didn't even know that was against God. And then you read something in the Bible, it's like, oh, I shouldn't be talking like that. I shouldn't be living like that. God is making that known to us, and he calls us to repent. We've all fallen into sin through Jesus. There is forgiveness, but he doesn't want us to continue in such things. He wants us to repent. As I think about what I've said so far, whenever a person, a church, a corporation, or a nation takes a position against the Almighty God, it will not turn out well. It might seem okay for a time. Even think today how, how many major corporations have taken a position in favor of LGBTQ+, and yet how many of them have recently lost billions of dollars. That's kind of one example. When you take that position against God, it does not turn out well. Think about the United Methodist Church, one of the largest denominations in our nation, over 30,000 congregations. Now, our church body, 6,000. They have over 30,000 congregations. Now, just recently, you might have saw in the news where 5,000 of those congregations left the United Methodist Church. Why did they leave? They left over the issue that we're talking about today. So they were fed up with this immorality and they wanted to get out. Praise God for that. But there are still 25,000 that are in agreement with that. It's a bad situation. How can a church body that large be so in favor of something that is so much against the Almighty God? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I haven't even told you what the Bible says yet, so we'll find out more about that next week. But let me go just a little bit further today. So going back to Israel as an example. So the Lord gave them this warning all the way back in Leviticus 20. You are to keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. And then he tells them why so that the land to which I am bringing you to live will not spew you out, literally vomit you out. So the Lord is saying, I can see it coming, but I'm warning you, don't be that way. Continue to remember what I said, continue to put it into practice, and my hand of blessing will be upon you. But if you go the other way, it's not going to turn out well. Here we are as a nation, we had the blessing, we've gone the other way, God has pulled back the blessing in many ways. Again, I'm getting ahead to next week, sorry about that. But if we think about Israel though, what happened? Well, they didn't want God to be their king anymore. They wanted to have an earthly king like all the other nations, so finally God gave in and God gave them King Saul. That was okay for a while maybe, but that didn't turn out so well. And then King David, well, King David, he was one of the greatest kings of all time and the greatest king of Israel, except for our Lord Jesus Christ. And in so many ways, David was pointing to Jesus, but he was quite a sinner himself. But God did bless Israel under David. Then we come to Solomon, and Solomon, you know if you read the Bible, Solomon has so many sins that finally God said, because of the sins of Solomon, when he dies, I'm going to divide the nation. And that's what God did. Shortly after he died, the nation is divided. We have the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and it didn't go good from there either because the Bible tells us that after about 200 years in 721, God raised up the Assyrians. They came and attacked the northern kingdom and they conquered them. They put many of them to death and they took many of them captive back to Assyria. 
a horrible situation. You'd think the southern kingdom, because they are related, you would think they would say, oh, did you hear what happened to our brothers and sisters up north? They were so wicked, and the Lord God Almighty, he caused the Assyrians to come and eliminate them as a nation. We should repent. Did they do that? They didn't. They were a little bit better than the northern kingdom, but not much. And after a period of time, the Lord was fed up with them. So then he raises up the Babylonians, who were the new world power. They come and they conquer the southern kingdom in 586. Why did all that happen? Think about this passage here in 2 Kings. The Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. That's the northern kingdom. And then, thinking about the southern kingdom, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs which Israel had introduced. It should be an easy thing for us. We should always say, what is pleasing to God that information is here. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if we had like very powerful people in Washington? Let's say the whole Congress got together and they said, our nation is in trouble. We're going to study the Bible thoroughly. We're going to bring in some Bible-believing pastors. They're going to tell us what this book says, and we're going to make a major change in our nation. We're going to change laws. We're going to change our school system. We're going to change so much, and we're going to get in line with the Word of God. Wouldn't that be so amazing? That is my prayer for our nation, and let's keep in mind, with God, all things are possible. Because of what the northern kingdom did, because of what the southern kingdom did. Finally, it says here in this passage, the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, that would include both kingdoms, and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. Now, I don't believe the Lord is in favor of China, but keep in mind, though, was the Lord in favor of the Assyrians or the Babylonians? No, but he used them to bring punishment upon the people of Israel. Could the Lord raise up the Chinese and bring them to take us down as a nation? Certainly he could. Do we deserve that? Well, we have put ourselves in the crosshairs of the Almighty God, unfortunately. Let's realize what we have done, and let's repent. I want to give you just a brief um, introduction here to what we're going to do next week. These are the contents we're going to come to. Results of canceling God. So you're going to be shocked with our war record, what's happened with traditional families, church membership, violent crime, LGBTQ self-identification. These things are so much higher than I thought they would be before I looked them up. We're going to take a look at results of opposing God. We're going to look at parts of Genesis 19, Romans 1, and 1 Corinthians 6. Now keep in mind, we're not talking about just the sin of homosexuality. We are talking about all kinds of sins. So we're not trying to single out any one kind of sin, any one particular people. God is saying to all of us, realize that sin, when we continue in it, will lead us to eternal punishment. That's the key thing when we continue in it. So God wants us to see whatever sins we are in now. He's calling us to repent, and through repentance, he wants us to know in Christ we are forgiven. We're also going to take a look at the growing LGBTQ support. It's amazing how this is growing so rapidly within marriage, churches, corporations, Girl Scouts, our government, and we could go on and on, but those are some of the things I want to bring you next week. And then finally, we're going to end up with some ways to go forward. We're going to get back to the Bible, and we're going to see how no matter who people are, no matter where they are, no matter what they have done, there is a path to our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a path to forgiveness. There is a path to blessing upon individuals, upon church bodies, upon corporations, upon our nation. 
Thank you for listening today. I hope you're excited about getting a copy of the whole brochure. That will be next week. For right now, though, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, you know we live in a fallen nation in so many ways, and yet it's easy to go on with our daily lives and not really think about it so much. But I pray that you would help me to bring these issues to light between today and next week. Help us to realize a little bit better where we are, wherever any of us are in trouble, move us to quickly repent. And even for anyone in our nation that might come across this information, help them to know that we care about them. We love them. And that is why we are bold to speak the truth, not to hurt anyone, but to bring the truth in such a way that you might move them by the Holy Spirit to repent and believe and be blessed forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.